guys say good morning, Mr. Joe? Good morning, Mr. Joe. It's all yours. All right. Well, good morning, guys. I, I'm so happy to be back here. I was here a few years ago, um, and probably in 2016 I was here. But more importantly, I went to school here, too, so I was an alumni meaning I, I graduated. And when I went here, it was first to fourth grade. No fifth graders were here. They were all at Hampton Academy. So anyhow, I love this school. I love Hampton. I grew up in Hampton. It's the best town. Don't tell my kids that, because they live in Rye now, right? And I would have probably decided to live in, in, in Hampton, but my wife and I compromised with Rye. And that was the only place we could find a home at the time. So I love this town, I love this school, and it's a great school. So, and I love that you guys are studying pollinators, which is so great, and honeybees. And so what I'm gonna do today is you guys, it's called drinking from the fire hose, because I'm gonna basically give you a lot of information. And I got a lot to say, but I'm gonna really try to keep it to honeybees. And then when we get to about 9.30 or so, I'm gonna probably open it up to questions, because a lot of times you guys have questions, and then I'm gonna go back into presentation. Okay, does that sound like a plan? So keep your hands down when you keep those questions, um, just like you, you know the teachers asked, and then we'll, I'll ask those questions, I'll tell you those questions when we get to them, okay? So I can't run this video right now, but this is a honeybee swarm, and a honeybee swarm happens. It's really a neat thing. And a lot of people go, oh, a swarm of honeybees, it's crazy, it's you know, a scary thing. No. Well, it isn't, that's right. The honeybees are going out here and they're looking for a new home. And so this video will run. I'm hoping I'm going to show it at the end. But this actually started, and what happens here is like almost 10 to 20,000 bees were in a field, and we just had, I had my phone with me, and all of a sudden the air started going bzzz, and the bees from one of my hives started to swarm. And it's a perfectly natural thing that happens. And you know what's really cool about this whole thing that I'll talk about a little later on is the bees vote. So when the bees went out and they did the swarm, they all voted. They're gonna vote on a new location, a new home. And so the bees go through this whole process. But before I start with that, I'm gonna just kind of go and give you a real quick introduction. About CB Honey. And that's who I am. I'm, I'm Joe, Mr. Joe from CB Honey. And I started CB Honey in 2010. All right, gosh, I was, you know, and I was keeping bees before that, but I started CB Honey. I started it for a mission to do three things, actually four things. But for the first one is to preserve our farms and help our farms. So Applecrest, Saltbox Farm, any of the farms, there's one farm still in town here called the Herd Farm. There might be a small farm around. But I help all the farms in any farm in the seacoast that wants bees, I give them bees for free. Right? So I basically, and so a lot of times if I brought bees to a place and I give it to a farmer, it costs a couple thousand dollars. So I do that for free. And the reason why I do that for free is I don't want those farmers spending their money on someone else's bees that are from outside of the state and bringing them here. Because when they travel around the country, the bees do that, right? And they do, they do this pollination. The bees aren't really healthy, right? It doesn't help the bees. So I basically made an agreement in 2010, this is my farms. If you need bees and you're our New Hampshire, and maybe Maine, but if you're in New Hampshire, especially in the seacoast, I'll give you bees. And we'll talk about why pollination is important. The second mission, the second step was I needed to help pollinators. And the honeybees, which you guys have been studying, which are the best pollinators, I think, are awesome. And they've been living with us for thousands of years. Um, needed help because the pollinators were dying from pesticide. They were dying from diseases and changes to our environment, which I'll touch on. Okay, so, and pollinators aren't just honeybees, right? They're bumblebees, there's uh, native bees, like uh, there are sweat bees, which are metallic bees that look like transformers. Um, and then there's all different types of bees that pollinate, and we'll touch on that. And, and then I'll get to that. And then finally, um, you know, the other one is along with this is to produce the best honey. So what I do, and you guys are going to get a chance to get some of this honey because I'm going to send this home with your books, with your teachers, is you guys will get some of this honey and get to try it in class. Yeah. And so, all right. So, so, <laughs> and this honey is all local, and it, I also make it so it's traceable. 
even though I didn't put my QR codes on these. Um, this honey is all from um, the area, right? So this honey is, this white stuff is from, this one is from Rye, and then this one is from Hampton Falls, okay? And you'll see how it's different in color. And it'll be different in taste, which will be really cool to talk to you guys about. The fourth thing that's not in there is doing education. So I do a lot of education with schools and meeting with students and garden clubs and then businesses, teaching them about why pollinators are important and then how you can learn from honeybees, right? So part of what I also do is software. And I write code and we build software. And one of the things that we do is when we write a piece of code, we can reuse it. Or we might write software that does multiple tasks. And it goes through step one, step two, step three, step four. Well, honeybees, and the way honeybees work, it's like a really good software system. And we'll touch on that. So um, back to like me showing and educating, it's, is finally that, that, third, that fourth goal of, of the CB Honey is to help educate people, and that's what we're doing today. Um, I run between 100 and 300 beehives across all the way from Hampton Falls all the way up to Kenny Bunk, um, if you guys know where Kenny Bunk Court is, and then out to London Derrick. So that's a big group, that's a big area. So any farm in that, and sometimes there's like little farms, and then there's places like community gardens, they'll say, hey, will you bring the bees? We heard that you like to provide free pollination. And I get a lot of calls, and I bring my bees there, okay? Um, I also provide bumblebee hives. And bumblebee hives are just like that. You guys ever see a bumblebee hive? Did anyone ever see a bumblebee hive? They live in the ground, okay? A lot of people see the bumblebee hive, huh? All right, so bumblebees are native pollinators. They're big, fuzzy, they're usually black and yellow, right? And they, they, they really, they do sting. I just want to tell you that, because I know from experience when I save them, um, they don't like to get moved. If you go and get them angry, they'll come in and they sting, and they can sting multiple times, which we'll get into. But they're awesome pollinators because they fly a lot of times when it's too cold for honeybees, the bumblebee will go out and fly because guess what? They're bigger and they have more um, they have more fur, right? Or hair. And um, so they also are native pollinators and they do really well with native plants like blueberries and squash and pumpkins. Okay? So I have 30 apiaries, actually that's about 60, and an apiary is any place where you have one or more beehives. So if I have five beehives um, at a location, I have one at Winnicott, by the way. So that one hive, technically I, I'll say that's an, an apiary there. Okay, and so um, Mr. Frodo, who you guys might, um, you might know Mrs. Frodo, her husband works up at Winnicott, and he said, hey, you want to put bees here? He has a garden, and we put a beehive there. So it's actually still there. I'll get your question a little later. So free pollination, right? So pollination is really important, and that's one of the things honeybees do. And you'll see, here's a bunch of farms that I provide, but Applecrest is one of the places where I provide all the pollination for them. And how did you like, you know, one of the questions like, Joey, how did you get into bees? Why did you want to bees? Well, as a kid, guess where I worked at? Applecrest. And guess what my first jobs was at Applecrest to do? I peeled apples, right? They couldn't find anyone to peel apples, so they said, hey, Joey, you're, you, you look like you want to peel apples. And I was like in eighth grade, which is kind of really young, but it's farm work, so I could go and after school, I'd get a ride over to Applecrest, and I went over there, and I would peel apples, and they would give me a big box of apples, but the apples were really small. And I would get paid, not by the hour, I got paid by the bushel of apples. So they would give me a box of apples, it was in a big thing, and I would go to the machine, at first it was a hand crank machine, and I'd put the apple on, and I'd take the small apple, and the machine would peel off the skin, and then I'd have to core it, and I would put it and I'd smash it, and it would fall into the bucket underneath. And one bushel, I'd get $2.50. It took me one hour to make one bushel with those small apples. So one hour, I made $2.50. So then I'd go back after the apples went in, I went into the cooler, and they had this big room, they still do at Applecrest where they store all the apples. And I go in, and I saw the same apples, 
that were Portland apples, which are a great pie apple, but they were really big, right? So these apples were big. So I took the big apples and I went and I started peeling those. And guess what? I could do four bushels in one hour. So I was making 10 bucks an hour in eighth grade, which is pretty good money then in 1980-something, okay? I didn't tell you what, what year it was. Um, so I, I was doing that, and then they said, Joey, you can't use those apples. You have to use those smaller apples. Why are you using those big apples? And I'm like, well, why are those apples are the same apples? Why is one apple small and one big? And the old timer that was there, Mr. Jake, said, Joe, those apples didn't get pollinated. They didn't get pollinated by the bees. That's why they're smaller. They got wind pollinated. So what the bees do is when the bees do pollination, as you can see right here, and you guys learn this is a bumblebee, it goes one flower to the next flower, and apples need actually a different apple to make um, a pollen an apple. So what happens sometimes a bee has to go to three flowers to get that and create, create that fruit. So what happens is if the wind does it, the fruit, the tree will still produce fruit, but it will be small and it won't have seeds in it. Um, and it basically is not a good viable piece of fruit. I mean, it tastes like an apple, but when you get a large piece of fruit, and it's because a honeybee or a bumblebee or some pollinator did that. And that's why all these farms that are around here want bees. Because guess what? If you're growing things and you have no bees, you're not going to get a lot of produce. And that means you're not going to make a lot of money. So when I go and I bring my bees to all these farms, I've had someone up actually in Portsmouth said, your bees, they pollinated too much. They hyper-pollinated. And actually, it's true. The bees can actually produce so much that the tree has so much fruit on it, it can actually get way over. But one of the things, that's a great problem to have, because guess what you can do? You can thin the fruit out, right? So there's a way to do that. So pollination, bottom line, is good, and that's why people want it, and it helps everything that you eat that's good and tastes good. Is They say every spoon of food that you have, every third uh, piece of uh, food that you have is because of honeybee. Right, that help pollinate it. And I always tell my kids that you know, pears, apples, le lemons, oranges are because honeybees were out there pollinating. So that's why all these these uh, farms use my bees. All right. So we touched on this, and I'll go really quick into it. There's certain things that get wind pollinated. That means the wind blows and it blows the pollen around. And guess what? That's when that happens. You guys remember in the springtime or the summer, you start sneezing. A lot of time that's because of pine pollen, right? So that pollen, and if you look under pollen under a microscope, and I'm more than happy to bring some samples by, you'll see there's spikes on it. And it irritates your, it, it irritates your airways. And that's why in your nasal uh, passages, and that's why you start sneezing, right? So wind blows and scatters pollen, and that sometimes works for apple trees. The wind blows through, and sometimes you get lucky, right? Um, but what's most important is agents, pollinating agents, and those are insects, but also could be an animal, like a bat, right? Or humans, and there's places in China where they use so much pesticides, they didn't have bees, and guys were going around with dust dusters, and they dust a pear tree, and they go to the next pear tree and dust it, right? And that is not as efficient as one bee, because guess what? One bee in its lifetime can visit 16,000 flowers. A human probably would take maybe 100 flowers in a day um, if they're lucky, right? And they don't do a good job of it. So insects do that type of pollination. And then there's different types of pollination, right? So which gets a little deep into this, but some plants, if you just have one peach tree, peach trees, that one tree can self-pollinate. That means the flower from that tree can actually pollinate another flower and produce a fruit, right? Then there's uh, self-pollination where there's like two flowers on a tree or one flower, and peaches are a great example of that. So honeybees do go on peaches, but they don't need to go to another tree to take that pollen to the other tree. Cross-pollination is really critical, and that's where apples come into play. Because apples, for example, if I have all Portland apples, and we grew, we said, let's start a farm here and plant one type of apple. Well, guess what? We would never get any fruit because they need another apple tree of a different type to create a fruit. So when you go to Applecrest, you'll say there's a 
Portland tree, then there's a Macintosh tree, and then there are different trees kind of close. And that what happens is when the bee goes to it, it goes to one flower to the next to make an apple. So I have a, a, a person that asked me for pollination in Hampton Falls. I've kept hundreds and hundreds of, of bees at, in Apple Crest, right? This guy lived maybe a quarter of a mile away from Apple Crest, down off of Brown Ave. And he said, I have this tree, Joe, that's never produced any fruit. I've been here for 20 years. It's never produced any fruit. And the reason why is because none of the bees that were at Apple Crest went over to his orchard. So what we did is I took bees, I said, let's fix that. We went in and I brought in uh, a hive of bees and he had about an orchard about the size of this room. And we put them right in the middle. And guess what? That year, he got apples out of that tree. This is kind of a, a great uh, high apple tree called the uh, Northern Spy. So pollination, bees are the best at it. Honeybees especially are the best at it. And they're made to do that. Butterflies are good, but they don't pollinate as much. And one of the things you'll see is honeybees have what on it? And I'll let you guys answer that. Does anyone want to take a guess? Hair. Hair. And that hair, they have hair on everything on their body. And so they actually have it. And so when they go from one flower to the next, they're dragging pollen. And the pollen actually, they, have a, they basically have an attraction. That hair creates almost like static electricity. You know, and then pollen gravitates to it, so bees will get it, and then a lot of times they'll take that pollen and put it into their pollen baskets on their rear legs. But what happens is there's still pollen grains, and these are thousands and thousands of pollen grains, right, to make one of these pellets. That pollen will, when it says, okay, I'm going to go to the next flower, some of that pollen falls off, and that pollen from one flower gets into the other, and it produces, that's what produces the fruit. Okay, which is what we're looking at here. Pollen grains, and let me pass this around, guys. These are all pollen grains. Please do not open this up, but these are pollen grains I collected just this year, and you'll see they're different colors. Pass it around. Um, and they all have different colors because they're from different flowers. And what I do is I put a pollen trap on the hive, and the bees um, will come in, and only a couple grains will fall off. But each one of those grains, excuse me, pellets is uh, is thousands and thousands of grains in each one of those pellets. So you just need a little bit of that pollen to produce a fruit. So I collected that. Now, I collect it because I'm going to feed it back to the bees and for educational purposes. Some people say, well, I want to eat that. And I heard it's great. But eating that stuff is really dangerous because if you're allergic to it, it will create, you know, it'll make you feel, get to an allergic reaction. That's almost too much pollen for any one person to have. Okay, now if you're not allergic to it, you can eat it. It's, guess what, it's protein. It's like a steak, right? You get protein. That's what the bees get from the pollen. And they bring that, that's what they feed to the baby bees, and they make something called bee bread. And I'm gonna let you guys see this piece right here. Whoop, did something fall off? I'm sorry. Um, be careful with this, but you'll see it. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm gonna just send, um, I want to show it to you. You'll see that there's pollen in here. So what the bees do is they bring the pollen back on their pollen baskets, and then they actually add um, a little bit of secretion. They have an enzyme and add honey to it, and they pound, they pound it in there, and it's called bee bread. And so this bee bread is what the bees will eat for protein. And when the queen is creating, you know, laying eggs, she needs protein. And the bees need protein to really build up, you know, muscle. Well, not muscle, but what they would say is like their, their fat bodies, basically, to keep them warm. Now, honey is from nectar, and they'll go into that. But the pollen is really important to the hive because that's their protein source. And in the springtime, it's really important for them to build up and create more bees for the queen to lay. So um, obviously that pollen gets in and it talks, you, know, you guys can get into this a little later, but um, that, that whole process of creating a fruit is right there. And really the fruit in like an apple tree is really just a flower. The flower and a lot of fruits that we have becomes the fruit, right? Once the blossom falls off, it gets pollinated, the fruit will be, um, uh, show up next. All right, I talked about this, so part of what we do is just my, my business is honey, beeswax, um, you know, and, and uh, that's, we produce all our honey 
in Rye. This is our honey house, so all the honey is brought back. I have this big machine at some point. If you guys want to do a field trip, we're welcome to do a field trip up probably in the springtime. Uh, we did this with the Dendera School. So we have a pollinator habitat. We bring everyone through. We pressed flowers. We looked at the bees. We had a, a, an owl ambassador. I'm not saying we would have the owl this time, but from the, um, the, uh, the Center for Wildlife, they brought this little owl, uh, which was the hit, by the way, because the owls, everyone's like, these are cool, but this owl is about this big. And it's the cutest owl in the world. I was going to steal it. They brought it to a couple things. It's so cool. Sorry, officer. Um, he's got. He's got a break. I better not. I was going to steal it. I was going to borrow it. So anyway, um, bottom line is this honey house. I don't let many people go into the honey house, right? Especially since COVID and everything like that. Um, I don't believe in the honey being really touched by human hands. I don't want anyone in there. I don't want germs in there. Now, honey's great because it's really it's it's hard to get germs in the honey because. There's no water in it, so, uh, or very little water. So we go in, and I brought all the kids in here, and they got to see the honey house, which was a really cool spot. Um, so there's, in the honey house, we have honey equipment to take one of these frames, which is usually smaller, and it's a bowl of honey, and we pull it from the hive, and we spin it in that big centrifuge. And I'll let you pass this around. Right, so, so what we do, by the way, how do we get to that, right? I, I think the bee is just this frame with a hive, right? So I give them a frame. This one's a plastic one, that one's wood. But what they'll do is they basically will produce beeswax. And how do they produce beeswax? Well, the worker bees will get into that, produce the beeswax. And that, that right there, they started on this one, right? So they pull that out, and then that's what's great about bees. A lot of people will call me up and they say, hey, you know, I got, I got bees in my backyard. If it's paper, it's usually a bald-faced hornet nest. It's not honeybees. Honeybees do not produce any nest with paper. They produce nests with beeswax, which is what they produce. And that beeswax, you can see what I, I here's, a, here's an example. If they didn't have that frame, they make these really cool designs. And this is, uh, you see how it's curvy? You can pass that around. Um, so what they'll do is they create those cells, and they create um, those cells for storage. So you can see without that frame, see how they did that perfectly? If you give them the foundation, they'll make it nice and flat. If you don't, it becomes this kind of crazy, um, kind of, it's, it still stores everything, but it's kind of hard for me to inspect it. So, and I can't spin that out, right? So if I got a, a, a thing like that, plain like thing, I can't spin the honey out. All right, guys, so, so let me get to the next slide. So we have the honey house and honey production. And that's what we do, and that's how we set it up. So when I talk to you guys about um, pollinators, I mean pollinators all together. Pollinator to me is anything that will help a plant produce a fruit or a vegetable, right? That's what a pollinator is to me. So we talked about it. bats can do it, um, insects other than honeybees. And then these are pollinators. And I actually see, and you'd say, well, wasps, which sting us, they don't pollinate, but they actually do. And they're not as good at it because they don't have little hairs on them. Um, but the ones on the left here are bees that we see all the time. Bumblebees, European honeybee, which we're gonna look at. I'm gonna bring those inside soon. Uh, carpenter bees, you guys ever see carpenter bee? It lives in the side of your house. Right? They're actually really good pollinators. Sweat bees, which are the metallic bees. Um, they have they look green and they're shiny or silver. I'll get your question in a second. And then there's mining bees, which are bees that live underground and, and live underground and actually they're really cool. Right? Now, these guys are hornets and wasps. And these are the ones that usually we get stung. And I, we all have sting stories, right? I got stung, I stepped on a yellow jacket. And I know everyone did, so let's not share them yet. Um, so bald face hornets, yellow jackets, paper wasp, mud dogger, sand wasp, digger wasp, and this one called a cicada killer, right? These ones, will, they look big, and I get calls all the time. They say, oh, we got murder hornets. Well, they're actually the, these guys, cicada killers, and they will eat um, cicadas, which you guys might have seen cicadas, but you hear them in the summertime. It's a thing that goes when it gets hot. Right? That's a cicada. So these are the types of pollinators. 
And my, the one we're going to talk about, the one that you talked about, is the, where'd the clock go here? Oh, the All right, good, I'm, we're, we're getting close. Is the uh, honeybee. And this is the one that I, I think is the best pollinator. So you guys have, you guys have been studying honeybees, right? Right? All right, so now I'm gonna, I always ask this question. All right, so there's three types of bees in the hive, right? You guys learned this? All right, there's a queen bee, there's a worker bee, and a drone, which is a male bee. All right, who thinks that the queen bee makes all decisions in the hive? Raise their hand. All right, who thinks the worker bees make all decisions in the hive? Raise your hand. All right, so there's only a couple. Who thinks the drone bee makes all the, the male bee, which is the, the, the boy bee, makes all the decisions in the hive. All right. So, it's not the drone bee. All right. And it's not the queen. Yeah, the queen doesn't make any decisions. A honeybee hive is run as a democracy. Right? Which we are, you know, so democracy means we vote, right? A couple weeks ago, what did everyone do that was over 18? They went out and voted. Guess what honeybees do? These workers vote, which is the most crazy thing. As a kid, when I was a kid, I said, well, bees are communists. They all work together, or it's a monarchist. And I didn't know any of that, right? Because I thought they all worked together. And, they, and the queen made the decision, and she told everyone what to do. Or that would be a monarchy. Um, that's not the case. And the reason why we use these terms, drone, queen, is because they studied this in the Middle Ages, and they said, oh, the queen is telling the bees what to do. And I still have people that give tours at Applecrest that they'll say that, you know, who hasn't been, haven't been trained, will say the queen is telling them what to do. Guess what? The queen makes no decisions. The only decision the queen makes in the hive is if she's gonna lay a male egg or a female egg. And guess who makes all decisions? Every morning, the bees go out to go pollinate. They come back and they find the scout bees come back and said, hey, I found a clover over on Mace Road. And I found an apple blossom over on Hawks Road. And then they, they share it with their sister bees. And then they say, hey, guess what? Let's vote on it. Let's figure out what we're going to get. And then they'll say, we want the apple blossoms because it's going to be better for our hive. And so each morning, they vote and make decisions. And then in some cases, they'll say, hey, this queen is not working for us. And we have to remove her and replace her. So they'll vote on that. And then when they do a swarm and they look for a new home, they vote on the new home. They send out scout bees after the cluster's formed and they'll say, hey, I found a, a, a place on Mill Road that's a hole in a tree. And then someone will say, I found one on Molten Road. And they send out scouts and they all come back and they give the coordinates. And then they vote and they say, they keep on voting until they get to two. And then they say, this is the one we want. And they basically make that decision. And they chase the queen to that new hive. So one thing I want you to know is the workers, especially the most experienced workers, are the ones that make the decisions. And they vote, which is just beautiful. Right? How cool is that? I love that. So here's the workers. Here's the workers with a bunch of queens. Who has that comb right now? Right? So with that comb, that's basically the queen will go in and lay eggs, and she lays these eggs, and then they put a piece of wax over it, and then that, that will hatch eventually. But that's the queen. She's a little bigger than the rest of the bees, okay? And that's what she, she basically goes around, and she's like, what do I do? And then they basically say, hey, go lay eggs. And if she's not laying eggs, they get around her, and they, they decide to remove her. They actually will neutralize her by heating her up, and getting really hot, and then that's how they'll, they'll kind of um, remove her from the hive. And then they'll take some of these eggs, and they'll feed them a little bit of a different diet, and they'll create a queen, or a couple queens, and the queens will fight it out. And if that queen doesn't work out well, then they'll replace her, right? Now, as a beekeeper, my job is to go in and say, hey, this queen's not working out. Let me help the bees, and I'll remove the queen on my own, and I'll get a new queen. So the queen is um, important to the hive. They need the queen to survive. But, um, you know, she's not the one that makes the decisions, OK? So we're almost going to get into a section of questions. But here's the honeybee life cycle real quick. You guys studied this. The queen lays an egg. The egg hatches. So it stays an egg in three day, for three days. Then it hatches, and it becomes a larva or larvae. 
right? And from four to 10, and then it pupates, and it basically goes through this kind of pupa um, stage. And then when it's in its pupa stage, from 11 to 10, that cell's capped, and it emerges as a newborn bee, which is all fuzzy, looks like a little teddy bear. And that the hair that it has on its body is all matted down. So it has this kind of like look to it, and it, it's like the first thing it does when it gets out, it starts working, right? Which is the greatest thing. So it gets out of the cap cell, and then its first job is to be a cleaner bee. And this is what's awesome about these worker bees. They have all these jobs that they do. So when it first emerges from day one and two, it's a worker bee. Uh, excuse me, uh, a cleaner bee, cleans up. Cleans up its cell after it gets hatched. It's like, I can clean this up, and then the queen comes by and lays another egg for its sister. Then it becomes a feeder bee, and they said, hey, we want you to feed her a nurse bee, and it will go out and feed uh, something called royal jelly that the bees produce, and they need to eat that pollen uh, bee bread to produce this, this um, it's like basically milk. And they feed that milk to these little grubs, right, the larva. And they say, hey, after a couple days, you know, you're not really good at it, so we want you to start with these big grubs, right? Don't start with the little ones. And then when it gets good at doing that, it gets another job, and it says you can feed and nurse the smaller bees, the uh, smaller grubs. Then it goes, and then this skips some steps here, then it goes and it becomes a construction bee. So it produces wax. The bees have wax glands, and the wax comes out as a liquid, and once it hits the air, it turns into a white flake. Right? And that white flake is really valuable, by the way. And then they take that and they make what you guys see over there, that, that comb, and they construct it. So they become construction bees, right? So that's like, that's when they're about, you know, probably around, um, you know, 15 days. Then they become guard bees. Those are the bees that will guard the hive. And so they'll sit at the entrance and they look for, you know, guarding. Other roles that they have is an undertaker bee. So if a bee or something dies in the hive, the undertaker bee will take it and fly out. After about 16 days of doing all these different jobs, what some of actually right now are heater bees, like outside, they're heating up the other bees, so they're doing that job. But once they get to about day um, 23 of their life, they finally leave the hive, and they fly out, and they do an orientation around the hive, and they say, this is our hive, and now they become the most valuable bee that can be, and that's in the hive, which is the forager. And the forager goes out and gets water, it gets pollen and nectar, and something called bee glue, which you guys can see on the edge, which they, is from uh, propolis, that they glue the hive, everything in the hive gets glued together, um, which I need to break out as a beekeeper, but they glue everything together. So those forager bees go out and get all those things each day. And then finally, after it's gone through all those roles, they break down, their wings break down because they basically have flown enough to fly around the, the world. And their wings is what, what, what kills the bee? Well, they work so much that their wings break down and they can't get back to the hive. And if they can't make it back to the hive, they're not gonna, um, they're not gonna stay warm and they perish at night. So, so that's about 42 days. Now the bees that were born just last couple weeks ago, those bees are gonna make it through the entire winter. Right? Those bees are a little different because guess what? They're not flying as much as they do in the summertime, so their wings don't break down. And those bees, I believe, are, I have a, thesis, a theory on this, is, are much more intelligent because they live longer and they've learned more roles. And then in the spring, when it gets warm again, they'll start flying and they go out and they start building up the resources in the hive again. So that is the life cycle of the honeybee. And I don't know if I can play this. Oh, I can. That's the bee dance. You guys study the bee dance at all? Yeah. All right, so when the bee comes back to the hive, they'll say, hey, we love what you found. You found apple blossom nectar, or you found clover. We want to go get more of that. Tell us where you found it. That bee will start doing a figure eight dance. And it does a figure eight dance, and it waggles its tail. So it does a waggle. And that waggle, the number of waggles based on the amount of the figure eight, will tell the other bees where that source of that nectar is, right? And it's based on the angle of the sun and the number of waggles. And I have to show you a video of that, so I'm gonna hopefully get to that at the end, okay? 
So we're at about 9.30. So I want to just hit on stressors real quick and then I'll open up these questions. So stressors, what's a stressor? A stressor is a, a, something that puts stress or, or really makes it hard for uh, a living thing to uh, function and do its job, right? Um, so what are the things, why are honeybees having trouble and pollinators? There's a number of reasons and I'm going to hit on some of those. Okay, so habitat change is one of them, right? So we have warm, we had warm, warm weather all the way into November this year, right? It was really warm, right? When I was a kid, like, we had a foot of snow on the ground like, in November, right? Maybe not, but it was like, it was snowy here, right? I remember walking home here from Marston School to, to where I live through snow and being cold, right? And going to school really cold. You guys have almost summer-like weather all the time now. And it's because we're coming out of an ice age, right? We are leaving an ice age. We're in a period of warming. And then there's things that are happening with um, what we're doing. We're putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, and that's creating that greenhouse effect and making things warm. Well, that, help, that disrupts the bees who want a winter, because in the wintertime, the bees will stay in the hive, honeybees stay in the hive, and they consume the honey I leave in there. I leave about 100 pounds of honey in each hive and they consume that and they don't fly. They basically go to like a really state of, you know, they don't hibernate, they're alive, they're not sleeping, but what they do is they slow things down and they're just like keeping themselves warm. And all of these, instead of uh, flapping their wings to fly, they flap their muscles to shiver. The bees start shivering and it generates heat. And inside the hive, it's 90, they create, a, it's about the size of a basketball. The inside of that cluster is 98 degrees. And that's where the queen is. And then the bees on the outside, it's 70 degrees. And then when it gets cold on minus 20 degrees, right, I put a temperature gauge in some of my hives. When we have the wind chill in February, my hive is still at 70 degrees on the outside of the cluster, right? And they're doing that by generating heat. And then they're generating heat. Well, they obviously get hungry. What are they eating? The honey, that's right. So if you leave the honey in there, that they need, they're going to eat that honey and that's their food. And then they don't go to the bathroom. They don't need to go to the bathroom. And then on a warm spring day, they'll fly out and go to the bathroom and fly back in. The hive inside the hive is super clean, right? There's not anything in there. So habitat change really messes things up because in the middle of February, a couple of years ago, we had like two weeks of really warm weather and the bees were flying out. And they're flying out. And guess what's blossoming in, in February? Nothing. Right? So they're flying out and they're using energy and they're coming home hungry. And I have to fill, I have to feed them sugar water. And I spent $1,000 that season on sugar to buy sugar water for bees because they drink all their honey. Right? So that was a really uh, big problem for me. So I, I've gone through this process of, you know, making sure they have enough. The other thing is habitat change, okay? This is awesome. I love this because we're right here. Parsons School is like this big field right here, right? This, you guys know where Mill Road and Mace Road meet, the Ants Terrace? That's, that's the Mace's house. Oh, not the Mace's, that's the Bakers live there. That is a Mr. Eastman's house. If you go to, when you go to Hampton Academy, you'll see the gym's named after this guy. He's a teacher at Hampton Academy. And then Marston School is in this field over here. And as a kid, I walked through this field. Look at this field. It's called the, the hemp field. Uh, and then the windmill where the water tank is right up here. So the water tank is up here. If anyone knows where President, not Presidential Circle, Hobbs um, Homestead Circle, that house was just for sale right there. That's Homestead Circle right here. Ann's Terrace is in here. Dearborn Ave's right over there. There's an orchard right over here. Um, and that's him, right? And then you get woods. The woods are only there. But that, that was all pasture land, flowering pastures, and everything like that. Look what it looks like now. You guys, I didn't even show you this. Right? Right, so guess what? All those, those are nice lawns, but there's no, nothing blossoming there. So here we are again in Mace Road. Uh, Mace is right here. Here's Mill Road. Here's that old house I talked about. Remember Homestead Circle? It's right here. And there's that old house. You'll see old farmhouses like that. Someone mentioned the old Hobbs farm, right? So look what we did, and guess what? The bees don't have much to, to go up and get because there's a lot of lawns there. Now there are trees in here that flower and that sort of stuff, but there's a loss of habitat of foraging. That's more Hampton, right? So that's just another view. I grew up right over here. That's that's Vanderpool. 
This guy still has a field. We used to skate right over here, but this used to be a nice little farm. That farm's still there. Uh, I don't think he's farming yet, but that's still there. And then you can see, where that, remember that, that field? I, as when I went to school here in first grade and in, in fourth grade, I'd walk through that field, get up, cut through here, and that's all houses now. And that field, by the way, was full of milkweed. So back like in October, it would be full of monarch butterflies, and because they, they would be keeping in there. So um, pollinator uh, foraging, right? Forage is food for them is disappearing. So this is Wayside Farm. Does anyone live on Wayside Road or by the Wayside Road, right? That used to be an awesome farm. As a kid, I'd go there and get vegetables and fruits, and that was a few acres right there. Uh, so Marston Farm, that used to be a farm that is over by Tiller River. That was a cattle farm. Perkins Farm, uh, Rye Farm, Maze Farm. These are all farms that are all gone. Right? And hey, I'm not blaming anyone. I think it's, it's, it's tough, you know? People need to live somewhere, but that's Wayside Farm. This used to be all nice fields, like they had all these vegetables in there. Um, and it's a great place to live, don't get me wrong. It's, it's awesome, but... Um, so what we need to do is help save farms, right? So part of what I've done is st started saving farms, and here's one up in Rye that we start to save. Um, it's called Goss Farm, and I provide bees there. And then we also created a pollinator habitat that maybe you guys will go to in the spring, um, where we created eight acres of pollinator habitat and eight acres of that, some of that honey is from that pollinator habitat. So pollinator habitat, we put $10,000 worth of seed in that pollinator habitat. And now it flowers every day. Flowers every, every day, right up until uh, the frost. And now next year it'll start blossoming again. So that's what we um, have. And then finally, this is what everyone else um, gets scared of. This is, who's had ticks on them here? Anyone ever tick? You all live in Hampton, right? Who's had ticks, right? I, I used to play in these woods as a kid. This was in the 70s, right? We never had a tick. In fact, when I was in second grade, this, I think it was a pender kid or a shallow. What the shallows? Oh, pender? Yeah, a pender, right? Oh, um, I know. I think it was a shallow at the time. Um, he lived on Hobbs Road, and they found a tick on his head, and everyone in the school knew about it, right? So, so this is back in the 70s. Ticks were not around, right? And these things, which live on bees, are ticks that live on bees. These weren't around, right? And they showed up, and there's reasons why they showed up. They came in around the 60s, and they spread it. These things kill bees, honeybees. It's called a varroa mite. And the trouble with this is they live on the bee, and they're sucking the bees, basically kind of like making it, it's tissue basically, it's not even sucking blood. Um, so if you see it on a bee, if I see this on a bee, my hive is pretty much done. And you know, I can tell you they, live, they really do a good job of hiding, but those things live in the hive, they live off of the bees, and they feed off of the bees. And they really only live, live on honeybees, but these things showed up in the 70s, and we still haven't, we lost so many beehives that we don't have as many beehives as we had back then. That's why people lose their beehives. This is for Roe and Mike. There's a whole other discussion. Um, let me see if this video shows up. I don't think it is. All right, so I want to take questions, but Varroa mite is the problem with bees right now. People are losing bees because of pesticides, habitat change, and this Varroa mite. So everyone calls me up and says, hey, well, I lost my bees, can you come and look at them? And then I'll do a forensic sort of uh, like look at them, and there's usually mites, and the mites, and you have to treat for these mites. So you guys have been great, I want to take questions. Let's do this really, um, really quick, one question per person. And I'm going to start the front and kind of move it and try to be loud, and I'll start with you. Yes, okay, great question. So, um, what's your name? Devin. So, Devin just said that her mom was digging one time and dug into probably a yellow jacket, a desk and she tried to stay still. If you ever step on a beehive or yellow jackets, the best thing is to run. Run over 100 yards is the length of a football field, okay? And then don't jump in water. If you have a pool, don't jump, because they'll just fly around you above the water. Great question and statement. Uh, question over here. 
Ya. Yeah. I think it might have been. I might. I, it was part of Pender family in the shallows a little later. Okay. Yeah. And, and bottom line is, I wasn't sure it was that. I think it was a shallow. I was a kid that lived on Hobbs Road. And I think it was a shallow. Uh, question. A big D that was giant. Yes, it was red. It most likely saw, was a ball, a, a, um, a cicada killer. And um, good break. You know, that's one of the types of pieces. Questions, guys. Think of questions. I want questions and not statements. So, so stuff that you study that I didn't cover, you might want to know. Question. Nice and loud. The queen bee has eggs. Yes. Those are her children, yes. Yeah, so what happens is if you put a new queen in the hive, and let's say they lose a queen, they, um, if I just drop a queen into the hive, the bees will get upset and uh, remove that last queen. But if, let's say, they lost their queen, um, and then I add a queen, after a couple days, they're like, hey, we need a queen they'll accept the new queen. We usually put them in a cage with candy on it, and they'll uh, chew out the candy, and the queen gets out, and then she starts laying eggs, and they accept her. Now, they're not her children, right? Um, but she, they accept her because they know they need a queen, because all the, the, the workers can't lay eggs, and they don't, they don't lay fertilized eggs. If they do start laying eggs, that's a bad, bad thing for the hive. Um, and that means they've basically given up. So all the workers have said, look, our job is not to be the queen. We're not going to have, um, we're not going to lay eggs. Our job is we only have one egg layer in this hive, and it's the queen that we selected and, and produced. So who's kind of our mom or maybe our sister or somehow related. Uh, when they swarm, that's why they're looking for, they'll go out, and there's a whole other issue of biology that we talk about. But that's what the drones are. The drones fly out of the hive. But they don't, they don't mate with anyone in, the queen, in their hive. They look for uh, queens from other hives to start a family with. Right? So that's what the drone's job is. Uh, question? No. Um, what? Do you think that children can live on humans? No. Heroin mites cannot live on humans, and they can't actually live on other pollinators that we've seen. Right? They are specialized to live on honeybees. And they showed up in the 70s, um, and, and that's a whole other discussion, but I'll get in. Uh, that's a great question. They cannot hurt you. Uh, question right here, buddy. Are drones useless? I think drones do other jobs, but the drone's primary role, every day they fly up in the summertime and they look for a queen from another hive. Um, and then if they don't find a queen from another hive, uh, to start a family with. They come back to the hive and they get fed. And then around uh, this time of year, usually in October, the sister bees will throw the drones out of the hive. They said, you can go anywhere, but you can't stay here. And, and then they chill and die outside the hive. What's that? No, they don't rip off their wings. No, no they just drop them out. Um, a question. You can, if yellow jackets are following you, you can go, if you're faster than them, get them off you, go inside a house as soon as you can, um, yes, and get them off of you, because they can keep on sticking. What's that? I like to run straight. I stepped on a few yellow jackets, and then I had a friend of mine who keeps bees, and he hit a yellow jacket nest, and he's like, oh, the honeybees attacked me, and I said, well, do you have stingers in you? And he said, no, and it was yellow jackets that got him. Question. Well, you can run farther, at least 100 yards is what we, we say. So some bees will chase you longer than 100 yards. Like killer bees? Um, killer bees would probably chase you maybe 200 yards, but we don't have them here. So, so great question. I, I want to get to everyone's questions. And then I kind of want to get the bees up, too. Can you touch a bee? Um, sometimes the bees are some, uh, depends on the bee's personality. It sounds crazy, but some bees are more mellow than others. I don't need to wear a suit, and I can go touch those bees. Um, and then some bees usually are a little more aggressive. 
And part of the reason why I have the smoke here, the smoker, we give them smoke, that calms them down, and it makes them think that there's a forest fire. So we use a smoker as a beehive, and I go in and I smoke it. Um, and I kind of want to get the bees and put them out there so you guys can come by and see them. So if I can get out that door, they're right outside, and then I can answer some more questions. I'll, but I, I don't know if anyone's brave enough to go grab that. No, 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 the kids. All right, if you're, if you're familiar with bees, just pick it up from the bottom. Um, there's a couple handles. Don't pick it up from the glass part. But um, it's at a couple other places. But you can see on my website. But I just tell people to buy local honey. It doesn't have to be mine. Right here. Um, how long does a bee live? The bees that I, we just have one right here. Um, I'm touching it, and, and uh, usually in the summertime, about 40 days. But a new study just came out that bees aren't lasting as long as they did back when I was a kid, right? So they're not lasting up because of a number of issues, and they're just—I think it's genetics, right? So some of the bees that we're getting aren't as hardy as they were, and they're probably not being fed a better diet. I think that's a big problem um, for all of us, right? So that's why trying not to eat processed foods, trying to eat stuff that's local, and raw uh, fruits and vegetables rather than processed ones really are good for all of us, whether it's your animal, dogs, pets, livestock, and bees. Question? Um, they do. This, this is a honeybee. Once it stings you, it does die. And because, you know why? If, does anyone ever see a harpoon um, from fishing? It has this, the barbs on it. Well, they have, if you look at their stinger underneath, um, it will have, uh, it will have a, a kind of look like a harpoon. And what happens is it sticks in your skin and it can't pull it out. And so what happens is they rip their stinger out, and bees can't heal like humans because they're insects. They have an exoskeleton. Our skin will rebuild, right, and regenerate. A bees don't do that. So once it happens, once they have a, a break in their skin, they dehydrate. So they lose all of their, the, basically the moisture that's in their body. Um, okay. We, we have a, a, a hard stop at 10, right? Or can we go a little longer? Uh, I hate maybe all right, three minutes. All right, so questions. A queen bee, does it live longer than a regular bee? Yes. And I had a queen bee that was five years old. That's crazy. That's like living 500 years for a human, right, in the years. That's a long, long time. Um, and usually you don't keep them that long, but this one was really a special bee, and she did great, and I was just kept her going. And how do we know? Well, you actually put a dot on a lot of them. We're not going to be able to see a queen on there. I did bring a queen in a jar that's expired. Uh, you guys can see it, okay? Um, question right here. What's the most deadly bee for humans? Um, I think the killer bees are, um, but the murder hornet that is from Japan is, um, is a, my friend who went to school here too, lives in Japan, Kevin. He said, Joe, I was biking, and, and he got hit by a murder hornet on his bike, and he got stung, and it, it left a hole in, in this bit. It was huge. And these things have really tough stingers. Good news is we don't have murder hornets here yet. We call them murder hornets, but they're called Asian hornets, OK? So um, if you go to my website, you'll see a section on their school materials, and there's education right here. Um, and there's a section on murder hornets. Why would I put that up there? It, I should call it, but it gets a lot of clicks because I get so many questions on it, right? And then we have honeybee videos. So I want to show you the dance real quick. All right. Watch this be tell look, this isn't I love this picture, right? This this isn't um oh. look what she's doing. That is awesome. That is 
That is a, what we call textbook, right? You would put this in a textbook. What that bee is doing is, this is great, this is from downtown Portsmouth. This is in February of like 2017, or it was sometime around that time. And that bee just came back with crocus pollen, from a crocus, one of the first flowers that, that sprouts in the spring. And it, those bees were so happy. And there, she's doing that dance, and they love it. And so, yeah. There she goes. Glad to dance, and then she's doing a figure eight. If we traced it, it would be figure eight. All right, I want to, I want you guys to see the bees, but, 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 but. There is a queen bee in here. If you want to see the queen bee, I'm going to put it right up here. And then, by the way, this is beeswax that I, we produce from all that wax, right? So we produce hundreds of pounds of beeswax. And so you can smell that up here. What I want you to do is to start, set up a line. If you have questions and I'm going to get to your questions, I'm more than happy to get on a Zoom or come back and answer any of the questions if any teachers want me back real quick to do a quick question and answer. Or send them to me and I will answer everyone's questions. 